But time management and life hacks are all the rage right now, trying to people to save time. You know, our modern world is filled with technology and time-saving techniques. Nowhere in history have we had so many time-saving conveniences. For example, you don't have to go to the well and draw water. You just turn the faucet. Surely that would save us some time. Hot water. You want some hot water? You don't have to go gather sticks and firewood and start a fire and boil some water. You just turn the faucet. You want lights? You flip the switch. You don't have to go get a lamp and put oil in it and trim the wick and maintain that. Our modern world is full of time-saving conveniences, but it seems as if though we're just as busy as ever. On the next slide, we see a picture of a best-selling book written by Oliver Berkman. It's entitled 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. Now, the premise of this book is very simple. On average, a human has 4,000 weeks, and we should figure out how best to use it. Oliver says, quote, the average human lifespan is absurdly, insultingly brief. Assuming you live to 80, you have just over 4,000 weeks. Mr. Berkman's book is one of a plethora of time management books trying to teach us how to manage our time and make, make, make the best use of perhaps 4,000 weeks if you live to 80. But what does the Bible have to say about this issue of time? And can we learn anything about time and time management and what we are supposed to do with our time from the scriptures? Luckily, the scriptures have a lot to say about how we should think about time and how we should use our time. And we're going to look to the book of Proverbs today and learn six areas in which we should invest our gift of time. Proverbs is a book in the Old Testament, has 915 verses in it and about 800 Proverbs written to us to help us live wise, productive, fulfilling earthly lives. Now, what is a proverb? Take a look at the next slide. A proverb is a pithy, short, memorable saying. It's a concise observation about life meant to convey wisdom. You could also say that a proverb is a brief, general truth that leaves the hearer with a specific application. And the biblical book of Proverbs is jam-packed full of timeless wisdom about how we're supposed to live our everyday lives. And during the sermon series, we have taken a look at marriage, friendships, finances. Last week, we took a look at career. This week, we're going to take a look at the gift of time and how we should use it. And then next week, we'll wrap up our series in the book of Proverbs talking about your past, talking about how the things that have happened to your past inform your present and affect your future. So here's how we're going to proceed. We're going to pray and ask God to speak to us. Then we're going to observe three general things about time from a biblical perspective and then look at six proverbial principles to help us know where to invest our time. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, teach us to number our days, to value our time so that we can get a heart of wisdom. Lord, help us to think about time from your perspective. Help us to use the gift of time wisely. Lord, help us to use our time for others' good and for your glory. Lord, we need and desire to hear from you today, to hear your perspective about time. We thank you for the time that we have right now in this moment to gather together, to sing your praises, to encourage one another, to be fed and nourished from your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill this place, illuminate hearts and minds. Lord, may we hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's time to tackle the topic of time. And just to be clear, we're talking about our time here on earth. You have a birth date, and you're going to have a death date. And what we're talking about today is the in-between, your dash, that is your earthly time that you have. And so let's make three observations about the time that you have 
on earth. First, it's a free gift. It is a free gift. The time that we're spending right now together is a gift. The time that we just sung to God was a gift. Any time that you'll have in the future, whether it be an hour or a day or a week or a month or years or decades, that is a gift. I entitled this sermon Free Time because all the time that you ever had or ever will have is free. You didn't buy it. You can't manufacture it. Dare I say you don't even deserve it. It is a free gift from God. Look at Psalm 139, 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Psalm 139, 16 says you're referring to God. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. The psalmist is talking about God knowing the days that he would have before he was even born. And he goes so far as to say, as they were formed for me before I even was. God had your amount of time, your gift of time, set aside for you before you even were. Time is a free gift. Have you ever thanked God for the gift of time? Have you ever taken the time to thank God for the time that you have, for every second that you have, for every tick of the clock, for every grain of time that passes through the hourglass of your life. It's free. You didn't earn it. You can't buy it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift from God. Time, it's a free gift. And also, you have enough. You have enough. You have enough time. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 2 says, There is a time to be born, and there is a time to die. We all know that reality very well. And that time in between those two markers, those two bookends of your earthly life, is enough. It's enough for you to accomplish the purposes that God has placed you here for. Now, there's countless things you can do with your time, but God has given you enough time to get your stuff done. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything, there is a season. In a time for every matter under heaven. There's a time and season for everything that you need to get done. Verse 2, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence. I thought of so many things I could say right there. <laughs> but I should probably keep silent. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. There is a time for every matter under heaven. And God has allotted you the time that you need for the matters that he has called you to. From a biblical perspective, you have enough time. Time, it's a free gift. You have enough. And it's easy to waste. It is easy to waste. Look at Proverbs 19, 15. Slothfulness or laziness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. This verse warns us about laziness, slothfulness, wasting of time, just letting time slip through our hands and accomplishing nothing with us. It says that an idle person, one who wastes time, will suffer negative consequences. For example, it says perhaps you'll go hungry because you didn't use your time correctly. The fact is, is that you can waste time doing nothing or something of very little importance. And this is self-evident. Everyone in here or listening via online 
has wasted time before. We've all done some stuff and then turned around and wondered where the time went. What did we actually accomplish during that period? Caleb uh, is in Comp 2, his senior year in high school, and he just wrote a paper, and he, on the prompt, it was about binge-watching TV shows. And as I read through uh, Caleb's paper, he made the observation that you can sit down and plan on watching a few shows, and then you kind of get up off the couch hours and hours later, and you wonder what happened to your time. And once you get into the rut of wasting time, it's easy to get on cruise control and stick your head in the sand and then pull your head out of the sand of laziness, out of the sand of wasting time, and be shocked at how much time has passed and nothing has gotten done. Pink Floyd reflected upon this in their hit song called Time. The iconic rock band Pink Floyd's Time song contains some of these lyrics. Ticking away the moments that make up a dull day, you fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way. Kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. And then one day you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you where to run. You missed the starting gun. Pink Floyd reflecting that perhaps you can turn around and see in the rearview mirror 10 years and you never even really got started. You never heard the starting gun. So time is easy to waste, but as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we're called to steward this gift of time, this resource that we've been given. Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom, making the best use of time. So let's look to Proverbs and observe six investments that we should be making with our free gift of time. First, wisely invest time into planning. Into planning. Intentionality. Look at Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. There's a time and a season for everything under sun, but now is not the time and season for everything. Things have to be done in a certain order. There are priorities in life. You need to prioritize what's most important and do that first. This proverb was given in the context of an agrarian society where if you didn't harvest your crops, you didn't eat. People farmed and able to survive. And so what does the proverb says? It says, prepare your work outside. Get ready for your work outside in the field. Get your field ready. Camp out if you have to. Sleep in your sleeping bag. Put up a tent and then build your house. The proverb for these people in this time was, don't build your house first, work your field first. Get things done in the right order, plan your work, and work your plan. Wisely planning out what you do is critical to using this gift of time successfully. Look at Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance, but everyone who is hasty only comes to poverty. The plans of the diligent... Every resource, every gift that God gives us should be stewarded well. And that means planning it out. Taking the time to think through how to use your time. How to wisely spend your time. Because it is limited and it is a gift. It's a resource from Almighty God. Wisely invest your time into planning, being intentional about your time. And then also, invest your time into the Lord. Invest your time into the Lord the fear of the Lord, worshiping God, seeking the Lord, your faith, your relationship with Jesus. Invest your time in your relationship with your Creator, your Savior. Look at Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord, which is just another way that the Old Testament would say putting God first and having a correct understanding of who God is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This proverb not so coyly says that you're a fool if you don't put God first. Fools despise wisdom and instruction, but people that fear the Lord, who understand who God is, who put Him first in everything, 
They are on the pathway to knowledge. This is the primary reason that you have been given time. This is the main reason that you have been given time, is to know the Lord, to understand who he is, and then to properly respond to who God is. To seek him, to love him, to pursue him, to understand who he is, to worship him, to serve him, to know him, to abide in him, to rest in him, to love him, and to be loved by him. This is actually the starting point of wise living. Look at Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wise living is knowing who God is, knowing who you are, and how you should respond to those two things. So right thinking about God, putting him first, knowing who he is, making your relationship with him of supreme value is the starting point for right thinking about everything else. It's the place really to start really living, to have quality of life. Look at Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. Now we know, there's a saying, right, the good die young. We know that sometimes the good die young. And we know that sometimes the evil seem to live a long time. I think what this, the core of what this verse is saying is that it's not applying to the quantity of days, but the quality of days. Not to the quantity, but the quality of days. Fearing the Lord, putting Him first, knowing God lengthens and improves the quality of your days, your weeks, your months, your years, however long the time that the Lord has given you. Wisely invest time into planning, into the Lord, and into joy. Invest into joy. Proverbs 17.22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Do you know what a crushed spirit is? It is one that has no joy. One where the joy has been squeezed out, and all that's left is bitterness and resentment and selfishness and desires for what you don't have. All that's left is a critical spirit, one that looks for things to complain about instead of embracing the good. Instead of trusting God in every situation, that he is working all things for the good of those who love him. A friend of mine is incarcerated right now, and I've been keeping in touch with him via email. He doesn't have a lot of reasons to be joyful, but joyful is a choice. I mean, he's locked up right now. Listen to some of his latest email to me. He says, hey dude, I'm having less than a wonderful day. I think I lost the job I just got, but hey, I'm still alive, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. It's frustrating being in here doing it with no phone and needing a week or more advance to make an appointment to go to a job interview. You see, joy is a choice. And this person is choosing joy despite his less than ideal circumstances. You can choose joy in less than ideal circumstances. And you know one way to crank up your joy meter in your life is to get your eyes and your focus off yourself and your circumstances and put them on others. To care about them, to love them, to invest them, to encourage in them. My friend goes on in his email, how's things on your end? How are the kids? How's your truck? How's the church? He turns his focus off his pretty miserable circumstances and asks how I'm doing. He and I have talked about the fact that three weeks ago we I lost my mother and all that that entails and what I've been going through and all that comes along with that. He goes on his email alluding to that. Try to have a good one when things are bad. Try looking up for a while. It helps me oftentimes. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. You see, we can choose joy. And one of the ways that you can choose joy is to get 
your focus off of your situation and your problems and your stuff and turn your focus on others and invest in others and encourage them to have joy, encourage them to look up. Wisely invest time into planning, into your relationship with the Lord, into joy, and then also invest time into forgiveness, into forgiveness. Look at Proverbs 19.1. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense, to forgive. Let's be clear here that forgiveness many times is a long process. Getting to the point to where you can forgive somebody and you've processed everything that has happened to you sometimes can be a long process. But it's a wise investment in your time because when you forgive someone, it frees you. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness, unforgiveness holds you in bondage. It imprisons you. It incarcerates you in a dark cellar of bitterness. But forgiveness frees you even if the other party never accepts your offer of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the shackles of bitterness and vengeance. Why did Jesus teach us to pray? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? It's because Jesus knows that your spiritual health depends upon not only receiving forgiveness from the Almighty, but giving out forgiveness to those around you. He knows that when you forgive, it's really evidence that you understand the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that you yourself have received. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Hatred causes commotion and love forgives. Hatred looks for revenge and love looks for reconciliation. Forgiveness is a wise investment of time that is part of our sanctification process. It's part of our journey of becoming more like Christ. Wisely invest time into planning, into the Lord, into joy, into forgiveness, and you guessed it, love. Invest time into love. Jesus boiled down what life was all about to two things. He said, love God and love others. If you don't do anything else with your time, if you only invested in loving God and loving others, you would hit the time management ball out of the park. Now, we just observed that love is integral to forgiveness. Love is also better than stuff. Look at Proverbs 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. The writer of this proverb is saying, listen, it's, it's better to have table scraps and there be love around the table than to have a seven-course meal and there be tension and hatred and consternation. Proverbs 19, 22. What is desired in a man, what is desired in a person, what is desired in a woman, what is desired in a child, what is desired in a human is steadfast love. Is steadfast love. That's what we all desire. The people around us, if you've got people around you that are steadfast, lovingly, loving you in your life, that's what you desire. What is desired in a man is steadfast love, and a poor man is better than a liar. What are we looking for in people? Love. What is God looking for in his people? Love. Love God, love others. That last phrase there is intriguing, isn't it? What is desired in a man is steadfast love, and a, and a poor man is better than a liar. In the context of that first phrase, a poor man is better than a liar, means that Part of love is telling the truth. Part of love is telling the truth. So part of having steadfast love and displaying that is being truthful. Wisely invest time into planning, into the Lord, into joy, forgiveness, love, 
and family. Look at Proverbs 13, 22. This is all about family. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, an inheritance can be many things. It could be money. It could be wisdom. It could be a way of life. It could be many things. The point of the proverb is, is that it takes time. It takes time to leave a legacy of values, leave a legacy of wisdom. Wisdom has to be conveyed. Values have to be conveyed. If it's money, then you have to get out there and earn it or whatever so that you can leave it. But at the core of this proverb, the, the core of the principle is that family matters over the long haul, and it means investing time into family matters. And it means to invest time into family matters generationally. I'm not just to be worried about myself. I'm not just to be worried about my wife. I'm not just to be worried about my children, but I'm worried, supposed to be worried about my children's children, if in my case I ever get grandkids. Haley and Tessa, if you're listening, come on. Come on. A good man invests into family matters. Family matters that matter. And they leave a legacy and an inheritance, not just to their children, but their children's children. Think about that. The scriptures are saying that a good man, someone who lives wisely who walks in the way of the Lord, leaves a legacy, leaves an inheritance for their children's children. So when you're a grandma or grandpa, the life that you lived has mattered to your children and to their children's children. And that doesn't happen accidentally. That takes time. A good man invests his time into family matters and leaves a legacy an inheritance to his children's children. And speaking of children, look at Proverbs 15, 20. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Now, part of the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments is honor your mother and father. And many times, I'm guilty of this, you kind of think that that's for kids. So once you get to 18, you're an adult and you don't have to honor your mother and father anymore. Or at least it's kind of secondary because you're an adult now too. And maybe you have kids of your own. But the scriptures teach that you're supposed to honor your mother and father, whether you're one year old or a hundred years old. Look at the proverb again, 1520. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man, this isn't talking about children, this is talking about an adult, but a foolish man despises his mother. You see, as adults, we're supposed to honor our mother and our father. We're supposed to invest time in our family, all the generations of our family, because God designed the family to be the building block of society, so moms and dads and Kids and grandkids and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and should all be investing time in those family relationships that God has given you. Time. It's a free gift. You have enough. And it's easy to waste. So instead of wasting it, we need to invest it wisely. Invest it wisely by planning. Invest it into the Lord and your relationship with him. Invest it into forgiveness. Invest it into joy and love in family. Would you pray with me, please?